we are going to finish uh, part one of Pilgrim's Progress today. And a lot of you have been asking, even the last few days uh, since I got back, if we're going to do a GA report. Hopefully you saw in the announcements we are going to do a report on General Assembly next Sunday during the Sunday school hour. Uh, there was some conversation about doing it today instead, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and finish Pilgrim's Progress since we're really just one lesson away. So if you can be patient, um, uh, the report online from the denomination gives you kind of a general outline of some of the things that we did, uh, and we'll, we'll get into more detail next week, Lord willing. But today, uh, lesson 19, so we've been doing this for a little while. We're going to finish part one, which for many of you, so far as you knew, until this series of studies, was Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, a lot of you have told me that you never even realized there was a part two. Um, not not um, uh, as many of you have read that. Uh, I do hope that we're going to come back to part two later in the year, maybe this fall. Uh, we'll see how a couple of other things go. Uh, other priorities in teaching may preempt that. But at least now, um, studying part one in this way is, I think, equipping you to understand part two as well, even better. And I love part two. I'll tell you, it, I probably like part two a little bit better than part one, just in terms of its emphasis on the, ecclesio, uh, the ecclesiology of the Christian life, kind of the corporate aspect, the community aspect, uh, rather than one key character and maybe one companion, uh, there's an emphasis on the group of believers going to the celestial city. So there's some interesting lessons to be learned there as well. Let's start with a word of prayer and uh, we'll get into our material today. Gracious God, we're thankful for the blessings of worship, for the means of grace, for the hope of glory. We're thankful for the fellowship of the saints and for the encouragement that we receive uh, from one another, uh, even on the blessing that the Lord's Day is to us. Uh, we pray that you would bless this time of study, O oh God, as we uh, make our way through the last part of this precious myth. Uh, a story that has been told for hundreds of years and been a blessing to your people. We pray that it would continue to be an encouragement to us all, that we would see our lives in a more biblical frame, and that we would be encouraged uh, to do battle uh, and to be faithful even unto death. Bless us and keep us, we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of weeks ago, we saw in our last lesson, Christian and Hopeful encountered atheist, who in this case was an apostate, who had become a scoffer, so he was a former pilgrim who had left the faith, abandoned the way, and now uh, held the idea of pilgrimage in derision. Uh, we also saw two of the longest conversations in the book, uh, the uh, d d dialogue between Christian and Hopeful about their own salvation experience, as well as a second encounter and longer dialogue with ignorance. And ignorance is going to make one more appearance in the story here. So there's really three episodes where ignorance uh, uh, appears in the story, but we'll see that his end is not, uh, is not good. Uh, I am going to try and include most of this latter um, material, but there are a couple of minor omissions I've made. So if you're following along in your book or you're just reading along at home, just be aware there are a few places where I shortened the dialogue, but I haven't omitted any scenes uh, from what remains in the story. This lesson we will see the end of the pilgrimage. Uh, this last stretch is occupied with a discussion about godly fear and the way in which men commit apostasy. And it's a really, really helpful dialogue. It's actually the, the kind of topic that I frequently, as a pastor, have conversations with people about. How, how do men fall away from the faith, and why is that a danger for us? And then we'll see Christian and Hopeful arrive at Beulah Land and cross the River of Death. This is one of the most instructive, maybe in, um, in a strange way, comforting sections of the book. And then they will finally enter the Celestial City. So I'm going to let mostly the narrative kind of carry the weight of our lesson today. You'll see that even on the notes. I've given you fewer notes of my commentary and mostly just the text. Christian addressed himself thus to his fellow, Well, come, my good Hopeful, I perceive that thou and I must walk by ourselves again. So I saw in my dream that they went on a pace before, and ignorance he came hobbling after. Then said Christian to his companion, I much pity this poor man. It will certainly go ill with him at last. Hopeful said, Alas, there are abundance in our town in his condition. Whole families, yea, whole streets, and that of pilgrims too. And if there be so many in our parts, how many think you must there be in the place where he was born? 
Christian replied, Indeed, the word saith, He hath blinded their eyes, lest they should see, etc. But now we are by ourselves. What do you think of such men? Have they at no time, think you, convictions of sin, and so consequently fears that their state is dangerous? Hopeful said, Nay, do you answer that question yourself, for you are the elder man. Now understand the question that's being asked. Do you think that someone like ignorance ever is actually convicted of his sins? Does he ever really reckon with his condition? And is he ever afraid? Does he ever imagine that he's lost? Because we've seen in the dialogue so far with ignorance, he has no thought that he's lost. And, and this is something I, I frequently have reminded people as a pastor. It's only regenerate people who question whether they're regenerate. The hypocrite never has any doubts, right? And ignorance has had no doubts up to this time. Christian replied, then I say, sometimes, as I think, they may. They may have these fears. They may have this conviction. But they, being naturally ignorant, understand not that such convictions tend to their good, and therefore they do desperately seek to stifle them and presumptuously continue to flatter themselves in the way of their own hearts. So if they ever experience this, they're not going to recognize the importance of that, the benefit of that, and they're going to try to push it away, and stuff it down, and think about more positive things. Hopeful said, I do believe, as you say, that fear tends much to men's good and to make them right at their beginning to go on pilgrimage. Christian replied, without all doubt it doth, if it be right. For so says the word, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How will you describe right fear? True or right fear is discovered by three things. One, by its rise, it, it is caused by saving convictions for sin. Two, it driveth the soul to lay fast hold of Christ for salvation. Three, it begetteth and continueth in the soul a great reverence of God, His word and ways, keeping it tender and making it afraid to turn from them to the right hand or to the left, to anything that may dishonor God, break its peace, grieve the spirit, or cause the enemy to speak reproachfully. Now the ignorant know not that such conviction as tend to put them in fear are for their good, and therefore they seek to stifle them. They think that those fears are wrought by the devil, though indeed they are wrought of God, and thinking so, they resist them as things that directly tend to their overthrow, as if they were to defeat them rather than to help them. Number two, they also think that these fears tend to the spoiling of their faith, when, alas for them, poor men that they are, they have none at all, and therefore they harden their hearts against them. Three, they presume they ought not to fear, and therefore, in despite of them, wax presumptuously confident. Four, they see that those fears tend to take away from them their pitiful old self-holiness, and therefore they resist them with all their might. Now this is a helpful breakdown. As they are going down the road, ignorance is still a ways behind them, limping along on his pilgrimage, although he thinks you know, he's walking just fine, and that prompts this conversation. What is it like to be ignorance? What is it like to, to live in his mind? How does he think about himself, about his sins, about the judgment that is to come, and you'll see that throughout this entire story, Bunyan has emphasized the value of this kind of spiritual discourse. If the only thing you know how to talk about uh, is politics, or sports, or work, or you know, the bills, or what, whatever it is, it's not that those things are wrong to speak about, but we should be cultivating a life where we are constantly giving ourselves to edifying conversation. We should be cultivating relationships where we can have those, that kind of edifying conversation that is encouraging us along the way. And you see how Bunyan has been weaving that through the story from beginning to end. So they're talking about this question. Do you suppose these kind of hypocrites ever really feel gripped by the fact that they are sinners and that God may judge them for that? Well, false believers may sometimes feel conviction or fear of a sort. You can think about Judas right? Weeping, bringing back the gold pieces, throwing them into the, into the temple, you know, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. You think about Esau, uh, weeping when he realizes, I've given away my birthright and I was a fool for doing so. You think about King Ahab uh, on occasion being, being struck with a fear of God's judgment. Jeroboam, similarly. So there are examples of this in men that we know are reprobates that we, we know conclusively the Bible says those men are lost, 
And yet sometimes they do show that type of fear, but they don't have the true godly fear that the Spirit produces in a believing heart. And this relates directly to some of the, some of the controversy that we find ourselves in, right? Where uh, some people want to say, well, because it's not true godly fear, because it's not actually saving, it's not efficacious, therefore it's not fear of any sort. You say, well, no, <laughs> no, that, that's, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible does show that sometimes reprobates will come under conviction but it doesn't produce the same sort of positive repentance and transformation that the saving operation of the Spirit will produce. So there is sometimes a fear, but it's of a different kind. It's of a different quality. Insofar as they ever experience fear or conviction of their sin, they are liable to resist it. They will think, well, that's harmful. The Bible says, do not be afraid. I want to be obedient to the Bible, right? Well, the Bible says a lot of things, right? But everything has to be applied in its proper place. And, 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 and when you are feeling afraid of God's judgment because you are guilty of sin, that's, that's good, right, and holy. Like you should, I've had people literally come to me who were involved in some pretty ugly, unrepentant behavior. And they said, I just I feel really guilty, Pastor. Or, or I've confronted them and said, you're making me feel bad. I'm like, I'm trying to. It's probably pastoral abuse now, right? But... Yeah, I'm trying to. You should feel bad when you're doing something wrong. And yet the hypocrite will say, oh, I don't want to ever feel bad. I don't want to feel fear. I don't want to feel convicted. God wouldn't want that for me. That's absolutely what God wants for you. So that you can, you can have a positive, a wholesome experience of fear that leads to repentance and transform, transformation. That, that leads to fruit. And, you, and you've got to remember this when you're parenting. Right? You've got to let your little kids feel bad sometimes so that they can feel better. So that they can feel better. The child that is never made to feel bad becomes a brat. Right? You've got to sometimes let your children feel bad. Right? Let them be unhappy because it's good for their character. And the same way with God's children. What they experience is not ultimately true godly fear because that fear is known by its characteristics. And here we've got four that, uh, that Bunyan outlines in the course of the dialogue. It arises from the perception of one's own sinfulness and guilt. So you can see this in the Shorter Catechism's treatment of repentance unto saving faith. Like we, we come to realize the gravity of our guilt the reality of our sinfulness, the judgment of God that is against us. And that's where that godly fear comes from, is realizing I am a sinner. I have done evil. I deserve to be damned. That's, that's what you have to see. You can't be saved if you don't ever know that you're lost. You, can, you can't be saved if you think that you're fine. If you think I'm a good moral person, well, then Jesus is of no benefit to you. So true godly fear begins with that recognition that I'm not a good person, that I'm not righteous, and I have offended God. Secondly, that fear that is true, that is godly fear, drives us forward to Christ for mercy and salvation. So when, when you see the hypocrite resisting that fear, repudiating that fear, saying, no, 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 Bible says do not be fearful. I want to rejoice. I want to, I want to, be, I want to have joy in the Lord. You say, well, no, that's not, that's not going to Jesus. That's just, that's just seeking uh, to be relieved of the, of the burden of this experience in your mind. What you need is to go to Jesus. You need to go to Christ and let him relieve that burden. There's a period of time in the story, remember, where Christian is already converted. He's already a Christian. He's no longer graceless. He's Christian, but he's still carrying a burden on his back. You remember us talking about that for several weeks? How can he truly be a Christian if he still has the weight and guilt of his sin upon him? Have you read your Bible? Or, or have you had this experience yourself? But this is a lot of Reformed people, they, they think in this way. They think, well, you know what, if, if, if I'm really a Christian, I wouldn't ever feel guilt. No, if you're really a Christian, you will feel guilt. Because you will perceive your guilt. And then Jesus delivers you from it. So true godly fear drives us to Jesus. Third, it keeps us, it brings us and keeps us reverent and tender to the word and will of God. Okay, so it, godly fear makes us sensitive to God's word. I, I have literally sat in pastoral counseling situations, confronted someone with a passage of scripture that was indisputable in its meaning. 
and had them close the Bible and said, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, then at least we know where we stand, right? Godly fear says, whatever the Lord wants, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Whatever the Lord wants, that's what I want to do. And it may be a hard word. It may be something that I would not have chosen for myself, but if it's my God's will, then so be it. It builds within us this reverent uh, response to God's word, and it continues to keep us submissive to his will. Fourth, the hypocrite, by contrast, imagines that fear is the work of the devil, contrary to faith and to God's will for their lives, and is a characteristic of legalism. And so they resist it. Isn't that funny? Like Bunyan builds this into the story in several places, really re remarkable, and it's remarkably relevant for kind of where we find ourselves today. People will say, oh, no, 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 like guilt, guilt, conviction, that's a characteristic of legalism. No, it's a characteristic of gospel ministry. And, and, and we need to embrace that. The hypocrite doesn't want to embrace that. He wants to flee from that. Oh, I don't want to be a legalist. Well, you might end up an antinomian. What we need to want to be is just a faithful disciple. And that embraces both the operations, the convicting operations of God's law, as well as the comforting operations of his gospel. So do we recognize, welcome, and embrace the godly fear that is the fruit of the Spirit's influence in the heart? It is a fruit of the Spirit. That godly fear is part of what he's doing within us. Well, we go on with the dialogue. Christian said, did you not know about 10 years ago, one temporary in your parts, the man's name is temporary, who was a forward man in religion then. In other words, he's very prominent, right? He's well known. Christian, uh, hopeful rather, says, know him, yes. He dwelt in Graceless, a town about two miles off of Honesty, and he dwelt next door to one Turnback. Christian said, he told me once that he was resolved to go on pilgrimage as we go now, but all of a sudden he grew acquainted with one Save Self, and then he became a stranger to me. Hopeful replied, now since we are talking about him, let us a little inquire into the reason of the sudden backsliding of him and such others. Christian said, it may be very profitable, but do you begin? And you notice Bunyan frequently does this. He'll alternate in the dialogues. He'll also alternate who makes the mistake. So hopeful will kind of goof up and get him in trouble, and then Christian in the next scene will goof up and get him in trouble. Right? So it's, it, it's kind of a mechanical way of composing a story, but it works. Right? Hopeful says, well then, there are in my judgment four reasons for it, four reasons for this backsliding or apostasy. One... Though the consciences of such men are awakened, yet their minds are not changed. Therefore, when the power of guilt weareth away, that which provoked them to be religious ceaseth. Wherefore, they naturally turn to their own course again, even as we see the dog that is sick of what he hath eaten. So long as his sickness prevails, he vomits and casts up all. Not that he doth this of a free mind, if we may say a dog has a mind, but because it troubleth his stomach. But now when his sickness is over, and so his stomach eased, his desires being not at all alienated from his vomit, he turns him about and licks up all. And so it is true, which is written, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Thus I say, being hot for heaven by virtue only of the sense and fear of the torments of hell, as their sense and fear of damnation chills and cools, so their desires for heaven and salvation cool also. So then it comes to pass that when their guilt and fear is gone, their desires for heaven and happiness die, and they return to their course again. Now, pause here for just a moment. This is what you see when someone becomes a Christian only because, and no further than, the fear of condemnation. Like, it is good and right and holy for a person to become a Christian because he doesn't want to go to hell. And like, you should never shame anyone who is coming to Christ under that burden. Right? Praise God. But if you stay there eventually the intensity of that passion will cool. And most of you who are Christians today are not Christians because you are consciously, you know, and, and, and regularly thinking about the fear of hell, but rather because you love Christ, because you've grown to love your Savior, and, and you have discovered the life for which God made you, and, and that you are enjoying fellowship with Him, and, he, and, and you would still be a Christian even if there was no threat of condemnation anymore. You would still be a Christian because you love Jesus, right? But the apostate does not have that. To the extent that he is converted, he is converted because of an outward concern about condemnation. And when the fear of that passes, 
so too does any reason for his faith. Second, another reason is they have slavish fears that do overmaster them. I speak now of the fears that they have of men, for the fear of man bringeth a snare. So then, though they seem to be hot for heaven so long as the flames of hell are about their ears, yet when that terror is a little over, they betake themselves to second thoughts, namely, that it is good to be wise and not to run, for they know not what, the hazard of losing all, or at least of bringing themselves into unavoidable and unnecessary troubles, and so they fall in with the world again. Now that they're not worried about being lost, they begin to wonder, how much am I going to sacrifice? How much might I lose? How much might I be giving up? if I choose to serve Christ. You only live once, and, and, I, and I don't want to miss any of the wonderful things that this world has to offer me along the way. Three, the shame that attends religion lies also as a block in their way. They are proud and haughty, and religion in their eye is low and contemptible. Therefore, when they have lost their sense of hell and the wrath to come, they return again to their former course. It's hard to be a Christian in a world that despises being a Christian. It's hard to be a faithful Christian in a world that despises anything that looks like religious fanaticism. And so after a period of time when they're no longer worried about the judgment of God that is looming over them, they find it much easier to go back to an irreligious sort of life. And the number four, guilt and to meditate terror are grievous to them. They like not to see their misery before they come into it, though perhaps the sight of it at first, if they loved that sight, might make them fly whether the rich, righteous fly and are safe. But because they do, as I hinted before, even shun the thoughts of guilt and terror, therefore, when once they are rid of their awakenings about the terrors and wrath of God, they harden their hearts gladly and choose such ways as will harden them more and more. Christian says, You are pretty near the business, for the bottom of all is for want of a change in their mind and will. That, that's fundamental. Their mind has not been changed. Their will has not been changed. That has not been transformed. That's the basic issue with the apostate. And therefore they are but like the felon that standeth before the judge. He quakes and trembles and seems to repent most heartily. But the bottom of all is the fear of the halter. Not that he hath any detestation of the offense, as it is evident, because let this man have his liberty, and he will be a thief, and so a rogue still, whereas if his mind was changed, he would be otherwise. So Christian is saying all of that is right. Fundamentally, the difference between the apostate and the one who continues on the path as a pilgrim is the transformation of the will to desire to serve Christ. If you can do what you want to do, what is it you want to do? Right? So uh, Plato discusses this, right? Socrates discusses this in, in Plato's record of it. Uh, there is a man who finds a magic ring that turns him invisible. Does this sound familiar? Tolkien is a lover of the classics, right? So he finds a, a magic ring that makes him invisible. And what kind of a person would you be if you had a magic ring that could make you invisible? What would you spend your time doing? If you could get away, if you could go anywhere, if you could do anything, and no one would know that it was you, what would you do? And it's a test of morality. It's a test of your heart, your nature, your character. So the apostate would do sinful things because that's what he wants. He's willing to not do those things if it means I would suffer loss. But if I could get away with it, well, you know. So are you a Christian simply because you don't want to be damned? Or are you a Christian because you want to serve Christ? That, that's what it comes down to. And that transformation of, of will and heart is fundamental to the difference between the reprobate and the believer. Hopeful said, now I have showed you the reason of their going back. Do you show me the manner thereof? This is why they go back, but how do they get there? How do you get from being a faithful Christian to being an apostate? Christian says, so I will willingly. Number one, they draw off all their thoughts, all that they may from their remembrance of God, death, and judgment to come. They don't think about it. They don't think about God. They don't think about death. They don't think about judgment. They think about other things. Number two, then they cast off by degrees private duties as closet prayer, curbing their lusts, watching, sorrowing for sin, and the like. Private duties, things that nobody else sees, nobody else knows. I don't know whether you've read your Bible in the last week. I don't know whether you've, you know, guys, you've looked at every woman that's passed by you in places that you would not put your hand, right? I don't know where your heart has been, 
But that's what they begin to do. They begin to neglect private obligations and give themselves freedom. Three, then they shun the company of lively and warm Christians. They, just, they, they don't have time for fellowship. They don't make time and opportunity to be with the brethren. They're still in, in the worship on the Lord's Day, but they're increasingly isolating themselves from the company of believers. Number four, after that, they grow cold to public duty as hearing, reading, godly conference, and the like. Now they're skipping the Lord's Day. Now they're not coming to hear the sermon. Now they're, they're not present at the times that ordinarily Christians would gather. Number five, they then begin to peck holes, as we say, in the coats of some of the godly. What's the coat? The robe of righteousness. They're beginning to look at you and say, I'm not as righteous as you look. Like, yeah, you've got a coat, but I think you got that one from Goodwill, right? <laughs> that they may have some, may, may have a seeming color to throw religion for the sake of some infirmities that they have espied in them behind their backs. In other words, they want to believe that other people are not as holy as they seem to be, and in some way that will justify my unho unholiness. Number six, then they begin to adhere to and associate themselves with carnal, loose, and wanton men. Now we're not only isolated from the fellowship of the godly, we're in fellowship with the ungodly. Number seven, then they give way to carnal and wanton discourses in secret, and glad are they if they can see such things in any that are, not, that are counted honest, that they may the more boldly do it through their example. So now in private, they're, they're laughing about sin. They're talking about sin. They're making sport of sin. And if they see another believer doing that, that gives them even more encouragement to say, see, other believers are that way too. And that encourages them in their neglect of holiness. Number eight, after this, they begin to play with little sins openly. How far can I push the envelope before people begin to be scandalized? And then number nine, and then being hardened, they show themselves as they are, thus being launched again into the gulf of misery, unless a miracle of grace prevent it, they everlastingly perish in their own deceivings. Now that is a nine-point description of the progress of an apostate that is super helpful. Super helpful. I'm going to come back to that to that in just a minute. First, notice the four reasons Hopeful gives for why men who are initially converted turn back from following the Lord. And again, this is very important. This is something we emphasize here at Reformation that is not always emphasized in Reformed churches for reasons that you, I, you will never be able to explain to me. Um, apostasy is real. Like people who are in covenant with the Lord walk away from the Lord. They're fallen from grace. They're severed from Christ. They're judged because of uh, unfaithfulness and unfruitfulness. That, that's just a reality. Were they elect from the foundation of the world? No. Were they ever truly personally justified? No. That's not what we're saying. But it's just unquestionable that the warnings about apostasy in the New Testament are not hypothetical. They're descriptive of a reality. And that's something that the Reformed have always known. And why? Because some men who are initially converted do not have their minds changed. Their fear of Man, this says fear of God is stronger than their fear of God. I have no idea what that means. But I have not slept a great deal in the last several days. So the fear of, God, of man is stronger than their fear of God, is what it should say. The shame of religion is greater than loyalty to Christ, and they resist the sense of guilt and judgment that accompanies conversion. And that's what you see Jesus describing in the parable of the sower. The seed that is sown on rocky soil immediately springs up. There's conversion. There's an actual conversion. They receive the word with gladness, he says, but they don't have a firm root, and they do not endure. They eventually perish. Christian then details the incremental steps by which a converted man becomes an unconverted apostate, and this is important. Nobody goes to bed a faithful husband and wakes up the next morning, uh, you know, a person who is unfaithful to his wife. This just doesn't happen. You don't go to bed, a faithful believer, and wake up the next morning an apostate. That is not how it happens. It happens incrementally, over time. One compromise, justifying another compromise, justifying another compromise, until one day you look up and you realize, how did I get all the way over here? Like, I started out way over there. How did I get here? And it's little by little, little by little, okay? The devil, the devil is not able to make a complete reversal of your faith by a frontal assault, it's going to be by incremental 
undermining of your faith over time. So they turn their thoughts away from God and death and judgment. What should you be thinking about constantly? Meditating upon God, the ways of God, the wonders of God, the word of God, thinking often of your death, memento, memento mori, thinking often of judgment, that one day I will stand before the Lord, and it might be today. It might be this afternoon. How do I want to be found? Am I going to finish well? But the apostate begins by not thinking in those ways. And he's not thinking about falling away from the Lord. He's just not thinking about these things. Neglecting private duties of religion. Every body that I counsel that is struggling with their faith, I ask them, have you been reading your Bible and praying? I know what the answer is already. Of course you have not. Of course you have. Well, I, I can't do that, Pastor, because I'm struggling with my faith. Right. It becomes a vicious cycle. I get it. You begin neglecting private duties, and it's harder to, to be faithful in private duties. You shun the fellowship of the saints. You abandon public duties of religion. You begin fault-finding with other believers. Be careful when that starts to pop up. Like This happens in churches. Be careful when this happens in your life. When you start fault-finding with your brethren, you need to go back up that list and say, um, am I at step five? <laughs> Have I been slipping in some other areas and I haven't even noticed? Why am I suddenly so eager to find all of the faults of my brothers and sisters. What is going on in my heart that is leading me to think in those ways? Associating with the worldly, delighting in worldly speech and actions in secret, indulging small sins more openly, and finally, embracing a life of unbelief publicly. And you see this in the phenomenon of ex-evangelicals. You see this um, in the experience of the deconverted. Like I have, I have friends and associates who have gone through deconversions. Right? They'll share their testimony of deconversion. And, it, and it's not just that Christ is not for me anymore. There is scorn and hostility toward what's the, what they once affirmed. Hasten on here. Now I saw in my dream that by this time the pilgrims were got over the enchanted ground and entering into the country of Beulah, whose air was very sweet and pleasant, the way lying directly through it. They solaced themselves there for a season. Yea, here they heard continually the singing of birds and saw every day the flowers appear in the earth and heard the voice of the turtle in the land in this country the sun shineth night and day, wherefore this was beyond the valley of the shadow of death and also out of the reach of giant despair. By the way, remember the valley of the shadow of death is not death, not in this story. They haven't died yet. This is the last period before death, and it's supposed to say something to you about the pilgrim's experience as he knows death is drawing near. We'll talk about that in a second. Neither could they from this place so much as see Doubting Castle. They're so far beyond it. They can't even see Doubting Castle. What can they see? Here they were within sight of the city they were going to. Also here met them some of the inhabitants thereof. For in this land the shining ones commonly walk because it was upon the borders of heaven. You're literally having fellowship with the angels because you are passing over. You are about to pass into uh, heaven itself. In this land also the contract between the bride and the bridegroom was renewed. Yea, here as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so doth God rejoice over them. Here they had no want of corn and wine, for in this place they met with abundance of what they had sought for in all their pilgrimage. Here they heard voices from the city, loud voices say, saying, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh, behold, his reward is with him. Here all the inhabitants of the country called them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought out, etc. Now as they walked in this land, they had more rejoicing than in parts more remote from the kingdom to which they were bound. And drawing near to the city, they had yet a more perfect view thereof. It was built of pearls and precious stones. Also the streets thereof were paved with gold, so that by reason of the natural glory of the city and the reflection of the sunbeams upon it, Christian with desire fell sick. Hopeful also had a fit or two of the same disease. Wherefore here they lay by it a while, crying out because of their pains. If you see my beloved, tell him that I am sick of love. What is, what is Bunyan describing? He's describing that as you are getting older and you realize that you're about to die, you are longing so much for that city that it's making you sick here and now. I just want to go and be with Jesus. I, am no, I can't even see Doubting Castle from where I am, but I can see the celestial city. And it is so glorious, I want to go now, I do not want to wait. That's supposed to be your experience. Now, I'm not saying that to shame you if, that, if that's not your experience. But one of the things Jesus has delivered us from is bondage to the fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. You are not enslaved to the fear of death anymore if you're a believer. And as you are drawing near to the river of death, you are eager to pass over. 
our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's the experience that Paul describes, the continual renewal of the mind. Now let me skip ahead to this. There are, two, there are two difficulties that remain before them, the river of death and the gate of the city. Okay, You have but two more difficulties to meet with, and then you're in the city. Christian then and his companion asked the men to go along with them, so they told them that they would, but said they, you must obtain it by your own faith. So here are companions, guides, we will go with you, but we can't do it for you. You have to make it on your own. So I saw in my dream that they went on together till they came in sight of the gate. Now I saw further that betwixt them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge to go over, and the river was very deep. Do you see what we're seeing? The time has come. This is the river of death, and the gate is on the other side of it, and the water is very deep. At the sight, therefore, of this river, the pilgrims were much stunned, but the men that went with them said, you must go through, or you cannot come at the gate. The pilgrims then began to inquire if there was no other way to the gate, <laughs> to which they answered, yes, but there hath not any save two, to wit, Enoch and Elijah, been permitted to tread that path since the foundation of the world, nor shall until the last trumpet shall sound. Maybe King Arthur too, but you know, we don't know for sure. <laughs> the pilgrims then, especially Christian, began to despond in their mind and looked this way and that, but no way could be found by them by which they might escape the river. Christian's faith almost fails here. It's okay if yours does too. He still makes it. Spoiler alert, right? Then they asked the men if the waters were all of a depth. Are they all the same depth? No. Yet they could not help them in that case. For, said they, you shall find it deeper or shallower as you believe in the king of the place. The stronger your faith is, the shallower those waters are going to be. The weaker your faith is, the deeper the waters are going to seem to be. It's just the reality. That's not to shame you. Christian's going to find the waters very deep because his faith is very weak. That's okay. Did you know that you're saved by a small faith? Yeah, you're saved by a strong Savior. It's not the size or strength of your faith that matters. But it will affect your experience of death. Then they addressed themselves to the water, and entering, Christian began to sink, and crying out to his good friend Hopeful, he said, I sink in deep waters, the billows go over my head, all his waves go over me. Then said the other, Be of good cheer, my brother, I fill the bottom, and it is good. Hopeful is standing in the water. Christian is drowning. Then said Christian, Ah, my friend, the sorrows of death have compassed me about. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with that, a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian so that he could not see before him. Also here, he in a great measure lost his senses so that he could neither remember nor orderly talk of any of those sweet refreshments that he had met with in the way of his pilgrimage. But all the words that he spoke still tended to discover that he had horror of mind and heart fears that he should die in that river and never obtain entrance in at the gate. This is sad, but Bunyan's doing this on purpose because some Christians die this way. And it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is holding on to them. So, Hopeful is literally wading across. And Christian is drowning. He's dying. Right? But that's okay. Because Jesus is still holding on to him. Here also, as they that stood by perceived, he was much in the troublesome thoughts of the sins that he had committed, both since and before he began to be a pilgrim. I've seen this being with people as they died. Christians that had profound faith and come under profound conviction at the end, and they don't seem to have any assurance of their salvation. They're really, they're just constantly thinking about how awful their sins were. When Jesus took care of that a long time ago, sometimes, sometimes that happens. That's okay. It was also observed that he was troubled with apparitions of hobgoblins and evil spirits. Forever and anon, he would intimate so much by words. He feels like he's surrounded by the demons, but he's not. Jesus is holding on to him. Hopeful, therefore, here had much ado to keep his brother's head above the water. Yea, sometimes he would be quite gone down, and then, ere a while, he would rise up again half dead. 
Hopeful did also endeavor to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate and men standing by to receive us. But Christian would answer, It is you, it is you they wait for. For you, if they've been, they have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And so have you, said he to Christian. Ah, brother, said he, surely if I was right, he would now arise to help me. But for my sins, he hath brought me into the snare and hath left me. He thinks he's abandoned by Jesus. William Cooper dies this way. William Cooper dies believing that he's lost. We don't know his heart, but like the evidence of his life would be that he opened his eyes and saw Christ. Then said, Hopeful, my brother, you have quite forgot the text where it is said of the wicked, there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Hopeful's like, you're struggling with death. That's a proof that you're a believer. These troubles and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God hath forsaken you, but are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which heretofore you have received of his goodness and live upon him in your distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was in a muse a while, to whom also hopeful added these words, Be of good cheer, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. <clears throat> and with that, Christian break out with a loud voice, Oh, I see him again. And he tells me, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Then they both took courage, and the, the enemy was after that as still as a stone until they had gone over. Christian therefore presently found ground to stand upon, and so it followed that the rest of the river was but shallow, thus they got over. Right? So just have to remember this. If this is your experience, you have that kind of despair, that kind of panic, that kind of fear at, at the last hour. Just remember those passages. And if you are with your spouse or your parent or your grandparent or your brothers and sisters while they are dying, I've read these passages to many people as they were drawing their last breaths. Right? Pilgrim's Progress goes with me whenever I go to hospice. And this, this is telling you something about how to talk to them through that experience, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. I never know how to judge time on this, sorry. Now, upon the bank of the river on the other side, they saw the two shining men again, who there waited for them. Wherefore, being come out of the river, they saluted them, saying, We are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those that shall be the heirs of salvation. Thus they went along towards the gate. Remember that the angels carry believers uh, to paradise. That's in your Bible. It's Luke chapter 16. Now you must note that the city stood upon a mighty hill, but the pilgrims went up that hill with ease because they had these two men to lead them up by the arms. They had likewise left their mortal garments behind them in the river. It's not, not their clothes, but their bodies. They've been disembodied. For though they went in with them, they came out without them. They therefore went up here with much agility and speed, though the foundation upon which the city was framed was higher than the clouds. They therefore went up through the region of the air, sweetly talking as they went, being comforted because they safely got over the river and had such glorious companions to attend them. The talk that they had with the shining ones was about the glory of the place, who told them that the beauty and glory of it was inexpressible. There, said they, is Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, and the spirits of just men made perfect." You are going now, said they, to the paradise of God, wherein you shall see the tree of life and eat of the never-fading fruits thereof. And when you come there, you shall have white robes given you, and your walk and talk shall be every day with the king, even all the days of eternity. There you shall not see again such things as you saw when you were in the lower region upon earth, to wit, sorrow, sickness, affliction, and death, for the former things are passed away. You are going now to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and to the prophets, men that God hath taken away from the evil to come, and that are now resting upon their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. The men then asked, What must we do in the holy place? To whom it was answered, You must there receive the comfort of all your toil, and have joy for all your sorrow. You must reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers and tears and sufferings for the king by the way. In that place you must wear crowns of gold and enjoy the perpetual sight and vision of the Holy One, for there you shall see him as he is. There also you shall serve him continually with praise, with shouting and thanksgiving, whom you desire to serve in the world, though with much difficulty because of the infirmity of your flesh. There your eyes shall be delighted with seeing and your ears with hearing the pleasant voice of the Mighty One. There you shall enjoy your friends again that are gone thither before you. And there you shall with joy receive even every one that follows into the holy place after you. There also you shall be clothed with glory and majesty and put, an equipage fit, put into a, an equipage fit to ride out with the King of glory. When he shall come with sound of trumpet in the clouds as upon the wings of the wind, you shall come with him. And when he shall sit upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him. 
Yea, and when he shall pass sentence upon all the workers of iniquity, let them be angels or men, you, shall have, you also shall have a voice in that judgment because they were his and your enemies. You know the Bible describes that, don't you? Also, when he shall return again to the city, you shall go too with the sound of trumpet and be ever with him. Now, while they were thus drawing towards the gate, behold, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them, to whom it was said by the other two shining ones, These are the men that have loved our Lord when they were in the world, and they have left all for his holy name. And he hath sent us to fetch them, and we have brought them thus far on their desired journey, that they may go in and look their Redeemer in the face with joy. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There came out also at this time to meet them several of the king's trumpeters clothed in white and shining raiment who with melodious noises and loud made even the heavens to echo with their shout, with their sound. These trumpeters saluted Christian and his fellow with 10,000 welcomes from the world and this they did with shouting and sound of trumpet. This done they compassed them around on every side. Some went before and some behind and some on the right hand and some on the left as it were to guard them through the upper regions continually sounding as they went with melodious noise and notes on high so that the very sight was to them that they could behold it as if heaven itself was come down to meet them. Thus, therefore, they walked on together, and as they walked ever and anon, these trumpeters, even with joyful sound, would, by mixing their music with looks and gestures, still signify to Christian and his brother how welcome they were into their company, and with what gladness they came to meet them. And now were these two men, as it were, in heaven, before they came to it, being swallowed up with the sight of angels and with the hearing of their melodious notes. Here also they had the city itself in view, and they thought they heard all the bells therein to ring to welcome them thereto. But above all, the warm and joyful thoughts that they had about their own dwelling there with such company. And that forever and ever, oh, by what tongue or pen can their glorious joy be expressed? Thus they came up to the gate. Now when they were come up to the gate, there was written over it in letters of gold, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men bid them call at the gate, the which, when they did, some from above looked over the gate to wit Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, etc., to whom it was said, These pilgrims are come from the city of destruction for the love that they bear to the king of this place. And then the pilgrims gave in unto each of them, each man his certificate, which they had received in the beginning. Those, therefore, were carried in unto the king, who, when he read them, said, Where are the men? To whom it was answered, They are standing without the gate. The king then commanded to open the gate, that the righteous nation, said he, that keepeth the truth may enter in. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on that shone like gold. There were also that met them with harps and crowns, and gave them to them, the harps to praise withal, and the crowns in token of honor. Then I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy, and that it was said unto them, Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. I also heard the men themselves that they sang with a loud voice, saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now just as the gates were opened to let in the men, I looked in after them, and behold, the city shone like the sun. The streets also were paved with gold, and in them walked many men, with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands, and golden harps to pray, sing praises withal. There were also of them that had wings, and they answered one another without intermission, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And after that they shut up the gates, which when I had seen, I wished myself among them. Now while I was gazing upon all these things, I turned my head to look back and saw ignorance coming up to the river's side. But he soon got over, and that without half the difficulty which the other two men met with. For it happened that there was then in that place one vain hope, a ferryman, that with his boat helped him over. So he, as the other I saw, did ascend the hill to come up to the gate, only he came alone. Neither did any man meet him with the least encouragement. Remember Luke 16? The rich man dies and, and is buried. When he was come up to the gate, he looked up to the writing that was above and then began to knock, supposing that entrance should have been quickly administered to him. But he was asked by the men that looked over the top of the gate, Whence came you, and what would you have? He answered, I have ate and drank in the presence of the king, and he is taught in our streets. Then they asked him for his certificate, that they might go in and show it to the king. So he fumbled in his bosom for one and found none. Then said they, Have you none? But the man answered never a word. So they told the king, but he would not come down to see him but commanded the two shining ones that conducted Christian and Hopeful to the city to go out and take ignorance and bind him hand and foot and have him away. And then they took him up and carried him through the air to the door that I saw on the side of the hill and put him in there. Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. So I awoke, and behold, it was a dream. This is the final lines in the 
part one. Now, reader, I have told my dream to thee. See if thou canst interpret it to me. Or to thyself or neighbor, but take heed of misinterpreting, for that instead of doing good will but thyself abuse, by misinterpreting evil ensues. Take heed also that thou be not extreme in playing with the outside of my dream, nor let my figure or similitude put thee into a laughter or a feud. Leave this for boys and fools, but as for thee, do thou the substance of my matter see. Put by the curtains, look within my veil, turn up my metaphors, and do not fail. There, if thou seekest them, such things thou'lt find, as will be helpful to an honest mind. What of my dross thou findest there? Be bold to throw away, but yet preserve the gold. What if my gold be wrapped up in ore? None throw away the apple for the core. But if thou shalt cast all away as vain, I know not, but twill make me dream again. And that's the end of part one. And that's the end of Pilgrim's Progress, as most of you know it. So... Um, I won't elaborate on that. We're already over time, but uh, I hope that uh, just reading it together is a blessing, even if it's not fully expounded. Uh, if you've got questions about it, you can talk to me about it. I'm always happy to talk about the book. I commend it to you. I reread it at least once every year, and I would encourage you to do the same and encourage your children to as well. Okay? Let's bow together. We'll close in prayer. Gracious God and Father, we pray that when the hour of our death comes, we would pass that river safely and with the assurance that you will lead us safely through uh, the rivers and that you will welcome us in at the gate of the city. We pray, O oh God, that you would in the meantime give us strength and faith and the grace that we need to finish courageously and well. Bless us and all whom we love, O oh God, and keep us in your love and care, we pray in Jesus our Savior's name.